Uh, our first speaker uh, today, this morning for us and uh, afternoon for him is, is Ap Kepper from the Estonian National Archives. Um, he's going to discuss digitizing early 20th century Estonian photography. Uh, I certainly hope uh, the attendees take a good look at this, this project and its results because I, I personally found the the images uh, that are being shown here are just amazing. Um, a great context uh, of part of our, our, you know, our, our joined history together as a planet. Uh, App is a, uh, is a digital archivist and visual artist from Estonia. Since 2016, uh, App Tepra has served as a senior specialist at the film archive at the National Archives, where he manages digitization and web access projects and conducts experiments on position of artists in archive, resulting in critical gestures that address the representation of archived images. Um, Ab, I'm not sure if, if you remember all this from yesterday, but I'm gonna be also a timekeeper here. So just keep a slight eye on your on your, your chat window. I'll let you know when you have five minutes left and, and so forth. So I am going to stop sharing and turn my video off and Ab, it is all yours. Sure. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you and uh, let's, let's start my presentation. So like Pete said, I'm representing the National Archives of Estonia. And um, for those who don't know, uh, Estonia is a small country bordering uh, Latvia, uh, Russia and, and Finland uh, in the Eastern Europe. And um, and we have a quite uh, colorful history uh, filled with different occupations. And um, so our national identity is, is quite young, but it's very strong. And we first gained independence in, uh, in 1918 and uh, enjoyed the independence until the 1940. After that, uh, with the Second World War, there came uh, the Soviet occupation, the German occupation, and the Soviets returned. So uh, until 1991, there were there were different occupations, and since 1991, we have been enjoying the uh, independence again. So this kind of really puts into the context of the project that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so let's continue. So the National Archives, uh, it's it's a large institu institution in in Estonia, and um, we have a, a large collections, and um, we. Uh, get materials from public institutions and, and private sector as well. We have a, the, the collection includes uh, uh, digital images uh, um, and uh, a lot of film materials and a lot of photos, uh, maps and seals and parchments. So it, it is a quite, quite large uh, institutions and we have uh, around uh, 200 employees. Uh, so, uh, and um, we're uh, in different parts of Estonia, mostly in two, two locations, in Tallinn and in Tartu, uh, which are quite large centers. So uh, the kind of structure of the archive uh, is filled with different departments and, uh, and we all work together to uh, collect materials, preserve materials and uh, to provide access to them as well. So I'm, re I'm representing the film archives and uh, we are situated in Tallinn. Uh, we're situated in an old uh, military prison, uh, which which was converted into the archives, film archives in the early uh, 90s. And since then, we've been uh, working there and uh, preserving uh, moving images, uh, sound and photos. And then we're hoping to stay here for a while now, but soon we have to move again. So in the film archives, like Pete said, I'm uh, managing uh, the technical side of the digitization, uh, mostly photography. And um, we have two benches there uh, for photographic digitization. Uh, one is for smaller format imaging. And there we use uh, uh, Kaiser and, uh, and uh, Kaiser accessories, uh, uh, copy stands, and uh, and uh, use Capture One for, for capture. And, and the camera systems are Nikon Z7 and uh, Fuji system as well. And uh, uh, as we are using the ISA targets and Golden Thread as well, I, I'm able to objectify, object, objectively kind of quantify the results as well, which is good. Um, yes. 
you know, in addition to the different benches that we're using, we have to make some items customly as well. Uh, since the budgets are quite constrained, uh, we need to be resourceful and uh, find uh, different creative ways of uh, approaching the materials as well. Uh, in addition to the digitization, I'm managing the development of a data database as well, uh, which is for our audio videos, audiovisual materials. Um, and um, this is this uh, the this database that I'm showcasing right now. It's in development, but it's going to be uh, live soon. We're trying to make uh, our collections more available and uh, working together with different designers and. Uh, Different uh, aspects of, uh, of of the usage of usage of the materials. Uh, we're trying to way, find ways to uh, be more kind of accessible uh, in different ways, uh, and we're uh, exploring different uh, ways to showcase the materials as well. And we're uh, exploring, uh, for example, the Triple IF uh, uh, um, servers and um, manifests uh, in order to get deep zoom as well in the future. And in addition to the uh, practical side of my work, I'm a visual artist as well. Um, and I, uh, I do different uh, art projects that are connected to the archives. And here you can see this, this project was connected to the restriction of photo albums during the Soviet era, uh, which was an interesting kind of uh, way to learn about the archives and about the past uh, and uh, what happened during the Soviet era in the archives. Um, uh, because these materials became really uh, like a weapon to use uh, to, to make, make propaganda. And this is my latest, latest project about digitization uh, uh, in the archives as well. So moving on about to the project, um, there is this kind of big action plan uh, in, in the Estonia right now. Uh, which is many years old already, but uh, it encom encompasses uh, many institutions, many ministries, and, uh, and the goal is to digitize uh, important collections uh, that are invisible. And this action plan uh, uh, mostly focuses on heritage from 1900s to 1940s, so mostly on the first Estonian independence and the items that are, are in danger of uh, disappearing or are in or, or just need to be accessed by people as well. And this uh, uh, action plan, uh, it's, uh, it's about different materials. It's about documents, publications, photographs, films, and objects. Uh, and, uh, and the goal is, uh, is, is to make uh, a quite large of, of uh, the invisible materials uh, available uh, by 2023. And um, we're using uh, different uh, European structural fund investments for that. And uh, different institutions are representing uh, the projects uh, and, uh, and working together with ministries. Um, for example, the National Archives uh, uh, are in charge of digitization of newsreels, of documents, uh, and photo negatives. Uh, and uh, this this uh, this work it's it's uh, it's a huge task uh, because uh, it, it encompasses uh, many different institutions and many different practices, and um, uh, so the work uh, uh, it's it's put together by different phases: uh, uh, collection mapping, project management, preparation of materials, tenders, digitization, and finally publication uh, on on public databases, uh, which we have different as well. So uh, about the photo project, uh, when we started in 2018, we needed to figure out uh, what kind of materials we really have in Estonia. We need to map the collections, uh, do research. And, uh, and in the end, we chose the time period uh, between 1900 to 1960. And as you can see, it is really, uh, this period is really kind of intense uh, by different uh, happenings, by different occupations, uh, and by different traumas. So it really has a uh, very high research value. Um, so yeah, the visiting of the institutions was, yeah. was very interesting. We could uh, travel around Estonia to uh, larger institutions, to larger archives, which were very well managed and uh, the collections were very in good, in good state. But uh, in contrast to that, we visited all, all, all as well uh, smaller museums where two or three people were working there. 
So uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see the different practices and uh, it, was, it was very helpful to them uh, because our specialists could uh, advise them for the preparation of materials and uh, different logistics as well. And in the end, uh, for two projects, uh, we have 24 museums and archives Estonia of, uh, of across Estonia and uh, smaller museums, larger museums, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a quite uh, interesting uh, group of institutions. And they're uh, participating from all across Estonia. So the material logistics are interesting as well and uh, to get all the materials to one or two places and digitize them and return them as well. It's, a, it's an interesting task. Uh, so with the two projects, uh, um, they're in two phases and th this is because the, of the funding structures. Uh, so we need to kind of manage the budgets and, uh, and separate the the projects and uh, and have different priorities for the projects and uh, so the first project is uh, has 22 institutions participating uh, with uh, 65,000 film negatives and 35,000 glass plates with digitization in two locations and uh, the second project is uh, only for eight institutions and uh, only for 5,000 film negatives but for 62,000 glass plates which uh, is a quite huge task as well and uh, again in two locations um so as i talked about the preparation before uh, we uh, advised institutions and uh, some of the materials need to, need to be repackaged and uh, and cleaned uh, and uh, and prepared for digitization as we have had so many collections some of this work was well done but since the uh, qualifications and uh, and standards and uh, just uh, the experience was different uh, across institu institutions uh, the results uh, varied as well um, from the uh, film archives uh, we, we are participating with a very large uh, glass plate collection so um, uh, which is around uh, 70,000 uh, items uh, and we need to clean those uh, glass plates and, and this this work actually took around five years to, to complete and then every glass plate need, need to be uh, cleaned hand by hand and then carefully uh, packaged and, uh, and so there's different nuances, nu nuances to this process and um, I think the cleaning process it's in itself it's very interesting and deserves a presentation from our specialists uh, and in here it's a good example as well let me see wow. Okay, let's continue. So uh, after the preparations, we need to think about the priorities for this decision and uh, what are the different methods and, and standards and practices uh, across uh, the world. Uh, so we needed to kind of research this topic and, uh, and work with uh, uh, specialists from abroad. This is a market research and uh, and uh, and finally uh, uh, put together some kind of priority lists for that as well and then uh, always the first priority has been the heritage is itself because uh, the glass plates for example they're are fragile materials and uh, and uh, usually in the past uh, the digitization kind of uh, projects have been re reoccurring and some of the materials have been needed to re-digitize so i need to, need to find different ways how to kind of digitize the items uh, in a way that uh, they don't have to come out in the vault after they've been digitized uh, once um, and um, and the second priority is of course finding the standards and practices for that and uh, in that case we've been lucky to uh, have had a, a specialist visiting uh, in Estonia in 2018 uh, Don Williams uh, which was this event was organized by Vaur Buik from the Estonian uh, Photographic Heritage Society and uh, this was very kind of enlightening uh, seminar for us uh, because this he kind of gave uh, a kind of a way for us to look at this process uh, objectively and uh, to look at standards objectively and uh, because uh, the FACI guidelines are, are quite abstract and uh, their guidelines uh, first and foremost uh, but for uh, the people working in the uh, archives that don't have uh, like a technical background 
it's uh, it's a quite heavy language for them. Uh, so Don kind of uh, gave us this kind of uh, kind of a very good uh, perspective on that topic, and uh, and people uh, understood the practices better. Um, and um, he has been a consultant with us throughout the project as well, helping us to put together the technical sheets for the tenders, and uh, it's been it's been very helpful. Uh, for the projects, uh, we decided on uh, on adjusted 54 star requirements. Uh, for smaller photographic negatives, uh, we decided that 3000 PPI uh, should be enough uh, for these materials, for these uh, old historic materials. And larger plates and uh, negatives, uh, 2000 PPI should be sufficient uh, for that as well. So, uh, as when we had this kind of practices and standards in place, we needed to find a suitable uh, partner for the project as well. And we put together an uh, international tender uh, with, with negotiations and test job. And uh, we need to hear about the past experience of the, uh, of the companies as well. And for me, it was very important that this kind of project would be a kind of a precedent uh, in the digitization of uh, photographic materials, for example, because it would have been very easy to put together a kind of a, a test sheet or a kind of a requirements for a project that uh, had a lot of negatives, but uh, the standards would be low. Uh, and we, we would have, have gotten a lot of done, but the quality would have been bad. And uh, I think uh, working with uh, these high standards helped us to find a suitable partner, uh, which was uh, Pixel Acuity. Uh, and uh, I've been in dialogue with them since 2019, I, I think. And then and in 2020, they, they won the tender uh, so we happily moved forward, um, but it, it was a very challenging task because the COVID arrived and uh, and the material logistics were pretty difficult for the projects and um, and the people needed to come here from the states and and different kind of issues that came with that uh, needed to be resolved as well. But I think uh, all went well, and in the early 2021, uh, Pixel Acuity arrived uh in Tallinn and uh, uh we could start to work here uh the equipment that they used is was DD Atom uh page one X, xyg uh and their DT uh film carriers and and capture one as well and I don't know if it was if it was GH, GH or not but uh people can correct me on that afterwards uh, so the process of uh film negatives uh uh, was quite. Uh, it was all made in a way like uh, in a in a in a. I don't know how to call it. It was very kind of. Um, it was in a in a conveyor method, which was very fast, very quick, very efficient, uh, and uh, I think the maximum amount of film negatives that they digitized was around thirty five hundred a day. Uh, I think it was the largest. Uh, amount that they got done in a day. Um, they had two handlers helping them, and uh, and uh, and the, and that's how the full days uh, went on and on uh, throughout the spring of uh, early spring of uh, 2021. Uh, the glass plate uh, digitization was done similarly, but uh, as the materials were larger and uh, harder and uh, and uh, with different kind of difficulties that came with the glass plates, uh, it was a bit slower. But I think the fastest day was uh, 1600 a day, uh, which was quite a lot as well. Uh, we haven't had this kind of pace in Estonia of this decision never before of photographic materials. So it was quite interesting to see the numbers. And I'm happy that the quality uh, uh, didn't suffer from the fast pace as well. Uh, so the quality control aspects um, during the digitization, they used uh, film target capture, uh, which they analyzed in uh, uh, golden thread, and I was able to access these reports as well to see how the work, uh, the con how to see the consistency of the work as well. Um, and uh, when they uh, finished the capture for the 
they they uploaded the materials to the um, Amazon Web Service, uh, and uh, and uh, these uh, photos were uh, the raw files were uh, post processed in the states. And after they uh, were done, uh, they were returned to us uh, by the same service. But so, but it took days. It took different a lot of days uh, for this process to uh, take on. So, um, I guess uh, when I received the files, uh, they're in different three different formats. Uh, in, in with JPEGs, it's very helpful for me to compare the uh, materials in the vault. Uh, uh, because these are small images and um, I can work with my laptop ter there as well. Uh, with the raw files, I'm able to do the quality control and then finally uh, there's TIFFs as well. Um, so the film negative si film, uh, file sizes are quite small, uh, which is good, <laughs> but the glass plate uh, file sizes are, are quite large, uh, which is fine for us. Uh, we don't have issues with storage. Uh, but uh, uh, quality controlling these uh, large files, uh, it really takes a toll on our computers, uh, but it's, it's part of the work. Uh, the TIFF files I uh, QC'd in, in mostly in Bridge, checking the metadata, the sharpness of images to see whether there's any focusing issues or other issues. And, uh, and uh, raw files EIPs I got to review uh, in the uh, capture one, which was very good because I could see the pro process throughout. I could see the adjustments made. I could see how the materials were cropped and uh, I could uh, basically uh, see the whole workflow in there. Um, so the film negatives we decided to crop uh, uh, without the edges um, and, uh, and uh, desaturate them. Um, and um, because uh, we didn't want the different kind of uh, uh, hues on these images. We just thought that it would be a good idea to have uh, these kind of printed black and white images like the photographer intended. But uh, glass plates, we decided to leave the edges in and leave the color in as well, because these glass plates have interesting in information on them about uh, the different kind of retouching uh, techniques or, or the damages as well. So they, they could be inverted again and researched uh, from our databases. And in future, we're looking to find different tools for the researchers in the database to do this, to do it uh, online as well. And the QC process, the file naming process, of course, it's, it's difficult just to check the physical materials and, and comparing them with the files. And there are different challenges uh, because we had uh, so many collections, different practices. There's the diversity of materials, of formats and the archiving systems. And uh, most of the materials were archived before the era of digitization. So uh, it's, it's been interesting for sure. Uh, different kind of surprising formats, for example, like you're seeing here. And the file naming, of course. If you look at the right column, the correct file name, uh, a lot of materials were named uh, non-sequentially. So um, we need to use different kind of systems uh, with scripts to rename them uh, because they were digitized in a in a fast and sequential way. And uh, the results, right, the results, um, it's a very kind of great uh, kind of, it gives, it gives us a great overview of the errors uh, that, that, is, that these materials are kind of uh, made in. And in here, for example, you can see the third day Independence Day parade in, in Tallinn in, in 1921. Uh, from the Literary Museum collection. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, historic buildings uh, from the National Heritage Port uh, collection. And, uh, and these kind of uh, damages to the negatives are interesting themselves and research worthy. Uh, so it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, then there's different occupational periods. Uh, and here you can see the uh, German occupation, which was very short, but it was very kind of uh, um, it was a short period, but it, it was very kind of uh, uh, emotional period for people because uh, when the Soviet, Soviets came, uh, Estonian boys went to the Soviet army. When the Germans came, uh, Estonian men went to the um, uh, German army. And in the end, there was basically a brother fighting against brother. So it's, it's a difficult, difficult past. And then there's the Soviets returning again uh, in the eastern part of Estonia. 
So you could see the whole process is kind of uh, rolling out throughout the process. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting. And there's the different scientific collections and looking at different scientific practices from the early 20th century. Uh, and then, of course, we returned to the early Soviet era with uh, the kind of documentation of the Soviet life in the in, uh, early 50s and, uh, and uh, early 60s as well. So I think the collections part kind of deserves its own uh, presentation. I think uh, as we're kind of preparing to conclude the project, we're returning the materials to institutions and now we can start promoting these materials uh, effectively as well. And one of the notable collections is our Yarn Viet glass plate collection, uh, which is a studio portraits uh, from 1900s to 1940s made around the city of Viljandi, which is a quite small city actually. But this large kind of sample size of uh, images uh, from that era, it's anthropological, it's very interesting, and uh, there's so much research on that topic. And it's the large, it's largest uh, collection uh, from one photo photographer in Estonia from that era. So we're quite proud to, to have this collection and uh, take care of the, this collection. And soon there's going to be a lot of uh, research interest in, it, in this collection as well. Uh, and here just made this kind of a negative to pos positive process uh, because I, I did an interview for the national uh, news and uh, uh, people are, uh, we're getting more and more interest now. So it, that's, that's pretty good. So the publication part, um, um, the materials have to be public at the end of the project and, uh, and they're going to be uploaded on different databases. Uh, um, the National Archives database, the, the portal museums, which is a very large portal for different museums. And then there's some smaller databases as well. Um, but uh, this, all of these images need descriptions as well. So there is a lot of work to be done yet uh, to connect these images to descriptions or create new descriptions on the image from the images. So the research starts uh, now as well. Um, very grateful for the Pixel Acuity team, and they have put together uh, um, this kind of uh, case study of our project uh, in the Pixel Acuity website. So if you're interested, you can go and look at it as well, um, because we're continuing continuing the cooperation with them with, with the second project, which is going to start uh, uh, at the beginning of 2022 uh, in two phases uh, in, in Tartu and Tallinn again. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, it's going to be an uh, interesting uh, new year for us as well. So, okay, I think uh, it should be uh, enough for me right now. Ah, that was just great presentation. Thank you for, for sharing all that with us. Um, you're, you're, you ended just five minutes before your allotted time, which is, which is really good because I'm sure we're gonna get lots of questions uh, popping in. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I, I can start now if you're ready to answer some questions for uh, from the attendees. Uh, we have one from Dominic. Um, want to know if uh, did you keep the raw files? Um, I'm trying to. <laughs> it's it's a difficult process uh, because uh, the different databases have different uh, kind of archival systems. Uh, the TIFFs are fine, of course, but I think the raw files contain so much uh, images, so much information of provenance of these materials. And uh, I'm trying to way, find a way of uh, uh, kind of keeping these images. Uh, at first, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to complete this process within the film archives in, in the National Archives, but I think uh, it's going to be difficult and I'm advising institutions to keep them as well to see where we can take this idea of raw files and uh, if we have the data we can we have it we have the data mm -hmm. yes yeah, I guess in certain ways it's it, it's a fairly economical file size um, so it might might make sense to keep those raw files uh, we have one from from Scott miles um, do you maintain an archive of, oh, same question um, okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Do you maintain an archive of the raw files? If so, why? But you already answered that question, so you don't need to repeat that one. Um, 
we have one here from Katie Carl. What are what sizes were the glass plates? Were they all the same size? So the formats were, were different. The, the, the smallest one were, ones were a six by nine uh, and the largest ones were, I, I think, 18 by 24 centimeters. So the, it was a quite a wide range. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's another part to the, that question. The second part of it, um, were any of them done uh, with multiple shots and stitch them together or were they all done in one uh, capture? They were all done in one capture and uh, for us it was sufficient because the grain was uh, just beautiful it was it was sharp and uh, i don't think we we need to just enlarge the grain uh, further as well yeah i have a question about resolution further on but i'll, I'll we'll go through the, the 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 attendees first uh we have a technical question here um and i noticed the same thing um on one of your sfr um charts it goes beyond 100 percent sampling efficiency um what, what is someone has a question about that um so i'm not quite sure how, how you want to answer that yeah i think this was a capture of uh preparing to capture the glass plates for 2000 uh, dpi um um i don't know if i can go very deep technically on that because i don't i would need to uh, look at the whole kind of report um, to, do, to do that. It was just an example of the chart. It goes quite a long uh, ways above 100 percent. Yes. Yeah, maybe maybe the parameters in the, in the software were set for 2000 and they, you put in mm -hmm. an over or an image that was uh, that was captured slightly higher. Yeah. Um, so golden thread it, is, is not very forgiving uh, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it needs to be specific for sure. Yeah, but it, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this is Arnab here, actually. Um, hey, Arnab. On this question, hey, yeah, just quickly kind of chiming in on this. Um, if I had to guess exactly what happened here, if you're looking at uh, four by five to eight by 10 uh, glass plate negatives, generally, if you're filling the frame, you'll get 2,500 PPI or 2,600 PPI, which is exactly what you're seeing on the vertical and the horizontal here. So what likely happened is, uh, the folks were filling the frame uh, and the uh, parameters were set to 2000. So essentially we're, we're kind of nailing 2600, uh, but the software is being asked to evaluate for 2000. So uh, it's showing it correctly as being 130 you know, percent of that value when it's actually right on the dot. It sounds like you're confirming my, my, my assumption or not. Thank you. That is correct. Yeah. Um, we have more questions here uh, from Scott Miles um, regarding the glass plates what was a primary subject type portraits landscapes or is it kind of a, a broad range of of things i guess it, it's a very broad range but uh i think larger collections were about people uh, about portraits but yeah it was yeah it really dependent on the collection like we had 22 collections in the first project so one of the collections was about portraits other one was about uh, architectural views and so forth Mm -hmm. But of course, you're not doing your, your you know, uh, the, the sports museums and so on and so forth with last place, probably very little of that, except for maybe team, team photos, I could assume you might have some of those. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Stefan. Why don't you scan all 70,000 glass plates? But I think you addressed that already with your second phase. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand yeah it needs to be phases in the phases of these projects and we can't go past these things because their budgets are restrained for that as well mm -hmm. we have a question from susan ross uh, about doing 3500 film negs a day i assume this is strip film um i think they want a little bit more explanation on that process a little bit if you yeah. can on that i think it was strip film yeah uh, for that day but uh, they use these kind of glass carriers as well, which could fit uh, many uh, 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 negatives in there as well. But I think this kind of uh, uh, this kind of large amount was was done by strip uh, negatives. Mm -hmm. um, let's keep going. <clears throat> um, for the glass plates, did you use holders or put them directly on the light box or light source? Uh, and if on the box or light box, do you have any issues with light leaks around the glass plates, et cetera? 
Um, they use this kind of specific plexiglass and uh, put the negative on there. First, I was concerned about uh, the marks that the glass leaves on that, but uh, I didn't see any issues on the raw files uh, as well. So the, the light leak didn't really uh, bother me. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the, the image coming through the quality control pipeline looked fine. That's the ultimate. Yeah. Uh, End use, right? So, so the so the plates are so with so strong contrasts. Uh, so uh, I was very worried about uh, uh, about losing information, but uh, it wasn't the case. Great. We have a, a a question that's causing about the colors on the negative, like the woman's face, and right now that you have on screen, that's kind of aqua. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the. What you can see on the woman's face, uh, this is a mask, uh, and uh, it's so it's uh, in positive, but in reality it's in negative. It's it's, it's like a red kind of uh, masking paint or something that the photographers used uh, in that era to retouch the faces to to enhance or or make some information disappear. So the, the blue thing you can see on the corners, it's uh, inverted. It's uh, it's brownish. So it's it's the water damage uh, uh, from the development phase or afterwards. You don't know. Mm -hmm. are, are you dealing with copyright and usage issues across uh, this this project? Sure, it's it's another kind of big uh, issue for the big digitization plan in, 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 encompassing encompassing different ministries. Uh, um, we need to address different uh, kind of uh, materials uh, in in different kind of phases because. The materials created in the Soviet era have this kind of questionable uh, um, um, copyright issues. But um, since we have the names of the photographers, uh, that really helps us. Uh, for example, with the uh, Riet collection, the one that I showcased uh, for, for my own collection, uh, the copyright for this collections, uh, collection is going to be aging uh, next year. So these, I'm hoping to make these glass plates available uh, in, in full resolution in TIFFs as well at some point. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly an issue we need to work on. Gotcha. Um, I have a, a, a question from uh, Jairo Orellana. Uh, he wants to know, are you selling prints? from this collection? Uh, we don't have this kind of um, um, marketing, uh, I don't know, uh, thing uh, right now in the archives that we sell the prints. Uh, we have a web shop, but we don't have this kind of correct, kind of uh, concrete idea of kind of selling these items. These are more about research right now, but I, I could see yeah, most, of, most of these materials are very aesthetic. Uh, it's one of the issues I think, because I don't want to make history too, too aesthetic. Uh, I want to stay true to the original materials. So that's why I think it's it's important that we digitize them in a way that we capture uh, the resol resolution that is in the uh, uh, plates and we don't enhance it in any way as well. Mm -hmm. I have a question from uh, David Almeida. Uh, how, do you, how did you go about naming the files after digitization? Did materials have to be handled twice for that matter? What would you do with that all in like, uh, I guess, post capture? Oh, there are so many examples. Some of these materials, the pixel acuity team would uh, name uh, uh, during the digitization correctly. Uh, the good example is our collection. It was very sequential. Some of the collections needed to be uh, kind of uh, catalog again from the institutions. And some of them, uh, we need to work on right now. We're working on them right now. So I'm in the process of returning these materials and I need to find different systems, how to rename them. And uh, I have people helping with me with that. Uh, so yeah, it's it's one of the challenges, as I, as I said, uh, for the project, because there are so many different uh, standards and practices for naming uh, the uh, plates and the negatives. Interesting. Excuse me. Um, we have a question here from Rachel Allison Jones. Have you seen any retouching techniques that look like squiggly scratches to texture skin? And if so, do you know how this was orig originally performed? I don't think I'm the person to ask that, but I have a, I have a person in the archives who she can ask that. Uh, so if you contact me later, I can I can 
put you in contact with the correct yeah, person. Yeah, maybe that'd be great for the for the breakout session. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. I, I actually wrote down a couple up if you don't mind me throwing a couple at you because um, it's such an interesting project. Um, now you talked about making this collection accessible. Uh, you talked about you getting funding from what, a variety of sources to make this project happen. My question is, as, as part of your funding stipulation, are you required to promote this program uh, to the greater community? And if that's a yes, are you being helped by your funding sources to do, to do so? Yeah. So as, as I said, it, it, this project is a collaboration of different ministries. Um, for, example, for example, the cultural ministry is kind of helping us to coordinate the, the publication process. So I, I only have to worry about right now how to communicate the materials of the National Archives uh, while promoting uh, the other institutions uh, as I can. But the uh, cultural ministry is putting different together different programs and different kind of ways of pe for people to access these materials. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and of course, one of the, you know, I imagine one of your biggest logistical hurdles or, or political hurdles is working with multiple institutions. Um, I can only imagine uh, what that was like for you, but uh, if you don't mind sharing some of those challenges with um, the attendees here, because I think it's a very interesting project. And once you deal with a variety of museum types, mm -hmm. uh, I could imagine that this is an uh, interesting challenge that you faced. I think it was very educational um, <laughs> from a good, in a good way and a bad way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was difficult for sure because uh, there's so many egos you need to manage. Um, and there are some institutions that are very helpful and others are helpful as well, but there's like this kind of distance because uh, we are a big institution, they are a big institution, and we, we need to find like different ways to collaborate. But I haven't really had big issues, no, no not at all. Uh, people have been kind of helpful and because in the end, we're giving them images basically for free. We're digitizing these materials for free. And they only need to kind of catalog the items again and publicize them. And it's a public, it's a project uh, made by public money and for public. So it's like a common good here, I think. So to that issue, since you're you're doing this work for free, is did you guys come up with a standard for cataloging and dissemination, or does every institution have its own uh, unique recipe for um, solving their cataloging requirements? Well, we're working on it right now because this these two won't be the last digitization projects, and uh, I have mapped many collections. Uh, after the 60s as well and then i start to see millions of 35 millimeter negatives and uh, i think we need to develop kind of uh, better practices for for that in order to digitize that this, these materials as fast as, as possible as, as uh, efficiently as possible so this is a thing i've been discussing in the archives and uh, in the community as well so hopefully we're gonna arrive at some kind of uh, i don't know some some some, some good good practices at, at some point. Okay, I'm, I'm going to toss one more question out there. Then we have to save the rest is for the breakout because I, I have more questions too, um, but I don't want to monopolize all the questions here. Uh, this comes from um, someone asked if in, in the digitization community, if someone in the digitization uh, community wants to visit, are you able to accept visitors to the archive, take a tour of the renovated? Uh, a military prison with the film archive being digitized. Uh, they think that would just be awesome uh, for them to go visit. With, with open arms, just write us, call us. Of course, it's a yeah, it's a great. collaboration. Perfect. Again, uh, this is a really great project and fantastic presentation. Thank you for sharing.